This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The distinct geology of Mediterranean climate zones. The challenges and promise of the new frontier of quantitative biology. But first, a fascinating look at how mathematician-musician Patrick Sannon combined physics and mathematics to solve a vexing problem of three-dimensional modeling. And a very smart puppy? All on this edition of On Beyond. Geometry lies beneath the graphical magic that made this tiger so convincing. Patrick Sannon used the tiger, the mathematical model tiger, to work on a geometric problem. Something that you need to do when you're making a movie or a video game is you need to paint on surfaces. If I have a character in a game, I need to say, you know, his skin is this color here and he has some hair here. How do I do that? I take the surface of the thing I'm dealing with and I flatten it out. I make a map. This method is what's called surface parameterization, which is to map a curved surface to a flat surface. And this is a problem that dates back centuries. And what's interesting about it is you can't do it perfectly. If I need to take something curved, I need to make it flat, I have to distort it somehow. Greenland is not as big as it looks on a map because in order to flatten out the sphere, you have to introduce more distortion in that area. So the way that all this relates to our work is say we don't want to just flatten out the sphere. We don't want to just make a map. We want to make a map of any shape. For example, the surface of a tiger. To flatten this tiger, we can actually use the same sorts of trade-offs that we can use when we're making a map of the globe. But first you need to define the surface of the shape geometrically. So the tiger as a digital object, as opposed to something you see on the screen, is really just represented as a set of points in a set of triangles inside the computer. Well, so the point is that the triangle is really the simplest two-dimensional shape. And by working with those, you can simplify your task of working with a large, complicated shape into the task of working with these small, simple shapes. So this is called a mesh, and it's the fundamental data structure in a lot of geometry processing. So we say each point in space has some location. Each triangle connects three of those points. If you connect enough of these together, you get a shape like a tiger or the surface of the earth or any other thing that you would see inside of a game or a movie. So everything you see is ultimately boiling down to triangles. Each triangle has a color, it has a position. It can have other data attached to it, like how much hair is on it. So when this mesh goes through the giant processing pipeline they have that takes it from this data to the tiger you see on the screen, Everything is boiling down to what's happening on a triangle. So this is a way to greatly simplify what happens with this tiger. If I want to say how it moves, I just have to say how each triangle moves. If I want to say what color it is, I have to know what color each triangle is. So I was very lucky to work with Rhythm and Hughes Studios because they let me work on their actual production models to test my methods. So we got to use this tiger because it's a very interesting model and it's a realistic model it would use to do computer animation for a film. No! Usually in the academic literature, you'll see the same tiny models used over and over. There's a classic bunny that you can get from Stanford that everyone uses. And this is great because everyone can test their methods and see how they stack up against each other. However, if I'm trying to model something that is as complex as something that would be in a movie, like this tiger, there's a whole new set of challenges that are involved. To find the best way to flatten more complex shapes, Patrick combined geometry with an idea from physics, elasticity. My contribution is taking the simplicity of geometry and marrying it with the physical rigor of elasticity. And what elasticity means on a basic level is just that I have some object, 
and how much stress is inside of it, how much force is inside of it, is just related to how much it's stretched. The simplest elastic object is a spring. This is an object that has some rest length, and as I stretch it, it stores energy. The more I stretch, the more force I get. So we understand very well the physics of elastic objects, of how stretchy things deform. We can tell you, for any given deformation of an object, how much energy it took to do that. So by minimizing this energy, I can come up with what is a pretty natural way to flatten a surface out. Essentially, they decided to treat that mesh made of triangles as if it were elastic. So what this realization that what we're actually talking about is elastic distortion, um, how much do things resist changing in volume? How much do they resist shearing, changing in angles? We can use that intuition to say, we're gonna solve this problem of making a map by pretending that the map is made of an elastic material. By formalizing the problem in this way, you can actually use efficient algorithms and physical intuition from a very well-developed area of physics to help you solve this geometry problem. We say, here's a triangle. As I stretch this triangle, how much energy is stored inside of it? How much force do I get resisting me? So if what I'm interested in is flattening a surface out that I can paint onto it, what I can say is I will just calculate the energy of flattening this object out. They calculate stretch across the entire tiger to figure out which arrangement of triangles will minimize distortion, measured as energy shown in red in these diagrams. So by minimizing this energy over an entire tiger, for example, I can find what is, in some sense, is the best way to flatten a tiger out into the plane. But you wouldn't want distortion to be evenly distributed because some parts matter more than others. It's important to allocate a lot of area to places that the camera is going to see because there, an artist has to come in there and actually paint all the detail on there. So if you look at a tiger's face, he has all these little um, whiskers coming out, he has different kinds of fur, different kinds of colors. There's so much detail there that unless we can control that in some way, we'll have a useless mapping to the plane. The challenge for us was trying to make sure that when we flatten out his face, we leave enough area in that part of the tiger's face so that an artist can come and paint onto it. So one way to do this is to do what's called a multi-scale approach where we model this tiger at different resolutions. So if I need to zoom in really close to this guy's face, I'll have to use millions and millions of triangles to represent that. If I'm just trying to do something from far away or I'm trying to figure out how he deforms, I can actually get away with using less information. So our tool allows you to do this in an efficient way and even in an interactive way so that an artist can come along, design a tiger, flatten the tiger, and paint on the tiger. Change it if it doesn't meet their artistic goals. Animate the tiger and then use it uh, in a fairly transparent way. You could say that the tiger is a series of points and triangles, but it doesn't look like that, does it? It has colors. It has fur. It has displacements. <laughs> It has levels of opacity. It has all kinds of information which goes from this very bare representation geometrically to something visual. Hey, smart puppy, how small are atoms? Really small. Watch this. An average human hair, kind of like this one, is about 80,000 nanometers wide. Well, that's a lot of nanometers. That's right, kitties. And that makes for a lot of atoms. Check this out. How many atoms are in it? If each atom were, say, the size of this peanut here, that would be enough peanuts to completely fill this ballpark. Holy hairball, smart puppy. That's small. 
You got it, kitties. Ooh, sure wish that was kitty chow. <laughs> Mediterranean climate ecosystems are among the most biologically diverse regions on Earth. Geological history has had a powerful influence on the evolution of each region's native species. The geology of the five Mediterranean climate regions can be differentiated into two types, old and stable, and young and active. The Cape region of South Africa and Southwest and South Australia are both ancient landscapes with infertile soils. These regions have experienced relatively little geologic disruption for 120 million years. By contrast, the Mediterranean Basin, California, and Central Chile are younger landscapes. Large portions of these areas were inundated by shallow seas. When Southwest Australia and the Cape region of South Africa were already dry land. In more recent times, these younger landscapes have been further altered by mountain building, glaciers, and earthquakes. In the old landscapes, millennia of weathering have leached a good portion of the nutrients from soils. To survive in these environments, plants have evolved special traits. For example, the Banksias of Australia and the Proteas of South Africa grow roots that form shallow, mat-like clusters. These roots have a tremendous amount of surface area, which helps them absorb nutrients like phosphorus. Some roots also release compounds that help take up minerals from the soil. These ancient, stable landscapes were also spared major climate and soil upheavals and have experienced relative environmental stability for over 20 million years. Such enduring conditions enabled many plant lineages in these regions to persist and diversify into myriad new species. In South Africa's Cape region, more than 9,000 different plant species are found in the area's signature Thainbos heathlands, and over 80% of those are found only in Thainbos. The type of sandstone that formed Thainbos soils is virtually devoid of nutrients, so ericas, proteas, and other Thainbos plants have become extremely efficient at using what nutrients they can glean. The trade-off is that, overall, these shrubs grow more slowly than those from more fertile regions. This, plus the fires that burn as frequently as every 10 to 15 years, makes Thainbos habitat sparse and open. The effects of poor soil can be seen throughout the Thainbos food web. Because the vegetation isn't very nutritious, the biomass of plant-eating insects here is relatively small, making insect-eating birds scarce as well. By contrast, Chile, California, and the Mediterranean Basin have had more tumultuous histories. All are located on the edges of tectonic plates. The process of one tectonic plate diving beneath the other, known as subduction, spurs the formation of volcanoes, uplifts mountain ranges, and causes earthquakes. Such upheavals formed new kinds of rocks and increased the variety of soil types, helping to foster more biological diversity. 
This can be seen in the plant communities that grow on the gray-green serpentine soils of California and the Mediterranean basin. Much of California's serpentine formed during subduction. Subduction heated and compressed the rock, changing its chemistry. Further earth movements pushed the resulting serpentine rock to the surface. Soils derived from serpentine rock contain heavy metals toxic to plants and lack critical nutrients. To eke out a living on such inhospitable ground, native plants had to evolve new traits. Many of these species exist only on serpentine outcroppings. An understanding of geological history can help inform conservation practices used in Mediterranean climate ecosystems. For example, the two older Mediterranean climate regions have many plant species with small populations found in a limited area. They have evolved in very localized combinations of weathered soils and topography. Because the distribution of these species is so localized, smaller, more fragmented preserves may be sufficient to protect their biodiversity. Yet plants in younger Mediterranean climate regions are generally distributed over much wider ranges. These species emerged relatively recently. They haven't had time to evolve into highly localized, unique species. Much of the plant diversity in these landscapes can be represented within a few large, strategically located parks. In this and other ways, the geological histories that shaped Mediterranean climate regions provide a framework to preserve these environments into the future. Hey kitties! What? Do you know what causes magnetism? Does it involve tuna? No. Chicken? It has to do with spinning electrons. What? Here, watch this. Imagine this is a spinning electron. Now, electrons carry an electrical charge, and a spinning charge, in this case, a spinning electron, creates a magnetic field. I get it. Electrons are like teensy weensy magnets. You got it, kitties. When you add all those teensy weensy magnets up, that's what makes things magnetic. <laughs> That's right. Hey, do those electrons look like tennis balls to you? Quantitative biology is the next revolution in biology. There's little doubt that all of biology will be quantitative in the next 20 to 30 years. We need fundamental principles. We need to understand what the Newton's laws are, the Kirchhoff's laws. What are these things in terms of unraveling the secrets of the organizational principles? A quantitative biologist believes that these principles exist. This is the excitement, developing those laws, developing those rules, coming up with the principles. Our work is based on the belief that the diverse qualitative phenomena of the living world can be understood with quantitative and unifying approaches rooted in physics. We aim at developing theories that are capable of generating concrete predictions, the predictions that can be tested experimentally in a biological laboratory. Quantitative biology needs creative thought that uses tools from physics and engineering to understand biological phenomena. We need to bring that kind of thinking into biology and get people to think about biological systems the way that engineers think about circuits or the way that physicists think about how stars move around. We want to train the next generation of people who know how to operate completely independently, people who are ready to attack problems where the questions aren't even well defined, students who are comfortable in this mindset. What I would hope for the students who are taking the program is that they dare to explore. The idea is really that they're going to create their own research problems and then we will equip them with a tool set so they will get training in instrumentation, electronics. 
optics, molecular biology, what they will be equipped with, which is unique, is that they will get these kind of hacker skills. And so they can help themselves when they have to address a problem. I want my students to be able to see through the beautiful phenomena of life to the fundamental physics questions underneath these phenomena, yes, to yes. master the process of formulating these physics problems. Integrating. Quantitative biology is more of an adventure. It's still an evolving field. There are new things that are coming. We want students to be trained in a new way. To make exciting new progress, you need new approaches. You need to tinker with things. You can't be afraid. So we want to teach them no fear. You have to go where the question takes you. There are big discoveries waiting to happen out there. Our students are going to be well-trained and poised to seize upon these opportunities. I'm JT Sauls, and I work in the June Lab. I'm really interested in evolution, and if I could somehow watch that in real time, and watch that at the single cell level, and quantify that process of evolving and selection and adaptation, has not been done yet to a degree where we can actually use evolution as a way to engineer the system itself. In the June Lab, we're really concerned with the quantitative ways to look at bacterial growth. Even in an isogenic population of bacteria, there's crazy variability across the population, and we have a special way to look at that. We have this device called the Mother Machine, and it allows us to simultaneously watch you know, a thousand bacteria over hundreds of generations, really. So it allows us to do these high throughput but single cell analysis of a population. If you actually look at 10,000 cells all at the same time, you see there's the slow ones and the fast ones, and the average is the same as it would be if you just looked at them in a big batch, but it's not like that at all. There's the big guys and the little guys, just like they're the big humans and the little humans. The June Lab really respects biology, and we don't take anything for granted, but we still believe that there are beautiful physical equations that can help describe seemingly super complex systems. And we're not afraid to think of the questions and then spend the time to develop the technology to answer those questions. My name is Jacqueline Humphreys. I work in the Swell Lab. Our lab is a microbiology lab that works on biofilms. So what our lab is interested in big questions, like what happens when single cells become a biofilm? What happens that makes a biofilm so resistant to antibiotics and other kind of environmental stressors, which they are, so why does that happen? One thing that I've been able to get into a lot uh, in this lab is microfluidics. The nice thing about the microfluidics is we can load single cells into the device and then film them the whole time and watch them grow literally from a single cell to a biofilm. And that's very important because we can see how one single cell changes into this whole biofilm. We do time-lapse microscopy and we'll use dyes and uh, fluorescent reporters that can pinpoint certain things that we're looking for. It's also been very interesting for me to be able to do because it requires some invention. It really kind of taps into sort of the more creative um, aspect of science. I've always wanted to be, you know, kind of a mad scientist and <laughs> it's fun to have now the sort of freedom and if I have something that I've come up with that I think is very interesting, I have permission always to go and chase it down. It's sometimes a little paralyzing because you don't really know what to do when it's sort of up to you to figure out the next path, but when you figure it out and you do it and it works, that's extremely rewarding. My name is Christopher Pierce and I am a fourth year physics graduate student. I'm currently doing research in the field of theoretical biophysics with my advisor, Professor Olga Dudko. I feel the most unique thing for me here is just Olga's research. It's just so unique and it's why I came here to UCSD. In our group, we're looking at a lot of complex biological phenomena and trying to find ways to interpret the experimental data on these systems in very simple terms that we can extract very useful information, such as the barrier heights located with a process or the characteristic distances. And so we're really trying to distill it down to these simple physical principles, and that's what I want to do.
I'm very, very interested in biomolecular transitions, like a protein that unfolds or folds, something that can transition via multiple pathways. A system that has multiple pathways is inherently a multi-dimensional problem. So we have to take this multi-dimensional world and pack it all down into one single coordinate and try to understand something about this big world from that little coordinate. I want to derive a nice, beautiful equation at the end of the day that helps me understand what is going on in this biological system. I would say that here, as long as you're willing to work and push yourself forward, that you can really do almost anything that you want. You want to do research on folding binding. There's a professor here. You can go find that professor and you can work with them. You want to do experimental work dealing with single molecules. You can find the professor here who can do that. And if you can't do that, if you want to do some other layer of research related to that, there's an easy way of establishing collaborations here that makes it so nice. I'm Naomi Martineau. I work in Dr. Roy Woolman's lab. I specifically look at wound response signaling to better understand how information is transmitted after the onset of the wound from cell to cell. Probably the biggest thing that we use is quantitative fluorescent microscopy. What's a little bit different about how we do fluorescent microscopy is we look at thousands of cells in a single cell resolution in our approach in a single experiment. The system that we're looking at is calcium to ERK signaling in the initial wound response. What we do is we wound the cells and we watch the calcium response and the ERK response. And then what I do is I use an image analysis technique that's developed in the lab where we're able to look at the single cell information. So we're able to actually see how much calcium and how much ERK response each cell has. And then we use an algorithm also developed in the lab in order to calculate the mutual information in the cells between the position of the cell versus the response of the cell. So one great thing about UC San Diego is that you really can try and tackle the question that you want to. Every day is, brings on different challenges and every day brings on different questions and different answers. And it's a really amazing phenomenon to think that what you're doing now is really going to influence people for many years. Thank you.